Hello my friends and welcome back to Arthur Ray Podcast, another episode and now we have here Hikma History YouTube channel. Welcome Tarek to the podcast. Thank you man, thank you for having me, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, did I say your name Tariq? Tariq? No, I like how you said it actually, Tariq, yeah, that sounds much more ethnic. Tariq, and where are you from? Uh, I am originally from Afghanistan, but um, I spent most of my life growing up in London, the UK. Afghanistan. And just before the podcast I hit wreck, we were talking how um, Soviet Union fought in Afghanistan in the 80s. They did. And, and like from my side, I know that my, my father's generation went forcibly to fight under the Soviet flag in Afghanistan against the Afghans. And I guess you have a separate story with that. The complete opposite, yeah, the, the other side. I know that uh, a lot of the Soviet soldiers in that in that conflict were from the satellite states, so mm -hmm. from like the Central Asian countries, um, and I guess, yeah, Ukraine, Estonia, places like that. But yeah, no, that's that's uh, that was the kind of milieu, the environment that I grew up in, abandoned tanks, um, because I, I was born only a few years after the last so, uh, Soviet soldiers pulled out. So you could still see a very visible impact that the war had on the country. And it was it was total. It was widespread, the, the impact of the war. It wasn't like a small, cute little conflict or anything. So I mean, when the Russians invade your country, it doesn't matter if it's the Soviet or Russia. It's not going to be a cute conflict. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, 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 leveled yeah. cities and... Uh... So like 30, 40 years ago, this podcast in a way wouldn't have been possible. Like if I would be representing the Soviet Union, there would be no way we would be, we'd be talking in peace like that, right? It's funny how life works, right? Yeah. Two generations later, here we are on the same side. Screw the Ukrainians, Slavo Ukraini. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, screw the Russians. Did I say? Oh my God. Yeah, I was just going to say. Well, that's, that's a very bad mistake to make. <laughs> Freudian slip up. It's fine. I mean, I'm tired, man. I woke up really early today. It's uh, you know, I now do five days a week of YouTube updates, and it's okay. Friday, and now I totally feel this rhythm of waking up seven a.m. doing the up, and it's fr it's Friday. My brain is fried. No, I it's, can understand, man. I can understand yeah. that. I'm sure loads of people can sympathize with that. I mean, what schedule do you have? My schedule is. Uh... What is it? It's it's very free form. It depends on what I what I need to do that week. Um, yeah, I'll just wake up at like eight, nine. No, not eight, nine o'clock, um, and then just get to to work. You know. But it's it's when you choose what you choose, right? Usually. It is. It is, and people think that's pretty cool and everything. And I guess hopefully in the future. Uh, I will feel the, the fruits of that, but for now, because I'm focusing uh, primarily on my YouTube, uh, because I'm starting out, it just means I have to put more work in than other people. So what ends up happening is I have to work 9, 10 hours a day, um, Monday through Sunday, um, and that's oh the Oh my god. Oh yeah. my god. That but is... I'm not complaining. I'm not... Um, it's it's a lot of um, effort and whatnot, but history is my number one hobby, so I'm I'm living my dream the way I see you, it. I mean, yeah, you couldn't do YouTube history channel without absolutely loving history, like to the core of it. Yeah, no, literally, I I, I dream about history and stuff like that. It's just on my mind all the time. It's kind it's, of sad. It's so yeah, no, I'm, I just wanted to comment that, like, I, I'm kind of young, you're young, and two young guys, like, we should be talking about drugs and girls, but we're like, history, damn it, yeah, let's analyze this and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with us, man? I don't know, man, I don't know, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, same. When I eat, usually, I, look, I eat, I, I'm used to watching YouTube videos as everybody, I guess. I always watch these, like, kings and general stuff like that, mm -hmm. analysis mm -hmm. and animated battles of, like, Middle Ages or antiquity. I think it's so mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Otter, I have to say, uh, your channel, it took me by surprise how, and I, and I told you this, <clears throat> how in-depth and um how clued up you are with the the war the conflict the war in ukraine how, so that's what you spend most of your day on i'm assuming right like just 
keeping up to date. Not with only it. my day, but all of my mental health capacity also. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, it's that's like, impressive. I must say. I mean, you wake up in the morning, you open Twitter, you start to research a video, and the first thing you see is a cuts up soldier blowing to pieces. It's like, yeah, happy yeah. Monday, <laughs> you know. And five yeah, hours yeah, later, yeah. I've shot the video and uh, trying to trying to manage. How, how do you uh, not not to make this out like it's a psychiatry session? But how does that affect your uh, mental health? <laughs> well, uh, great question. I'm I'm currently on Zoloft, actually. As you can okay. see, I'm I'm ki kind of smiley, giggly. First of all, because it's Friday and five days of tough work are done, and second mm -hmm. of all, I'm on like strong antidepressants. Because two months ago it went so bad. Yeah. And it's my livelihood, and I have a mortgage and everything. I have a good, I have a fiance. Actually, we're gonna get married. Like, money is not an easy thing, and all this pressure when you when you're talking about money with military content, it's so unstable. That yeah, yeah I'm I'm on Zoloft, and I'm even gonna increase the amount I'm taking because I can feel it working, and without it, like right. it's it's so dangerous. I can imagine, man. I can imagine. Yeah. How about you? How is YouTube treating you? Because it's it's a tough, tough work and tough position. It's uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very difficult. Um, it's not necessarily the most stable thing in the uh, orthodox manner in which people are used to getting paid and whatnot. Um, but I like the challenge. I, I noticed that when things get really sedentary and um, unstimulating in my life, that's when I'm most likely to jump on Zoloff and Xanax and things like that. When things are stimulating slash chaotic, uh, I'm good. You know, yeah, I know it sounds really yeah. messed up. It sounds really messed yeah. up because when things are like that, um, I can't afford to mess up. So it keeps me very... Um, you know, alert. You're one of those guys who actually performs better under a slight pressure all the time. Absolutely, I, I need it. Although I'm just, I'm just gonna get bored it's, because if 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 the results of something don't matter, then what's the point of even doing it? It's it's only if the results matter. If losing uh, hurts me, then I like it. But if losing doesn't hurt me. I might as well just stay in bed. Well, why even wake up, you know? I understand it so much. When I, I recently got ADHD diagnosis uh, in addition to depression, and then I understand, like, the, the brain needs... Oh, I'm not talking about TikTok brain. I'm just talking... My brain is hungry all the time for challenges and stimulation. And we're not even, like, talking about doom scrolling. It's just yeah. that I need a challenge every day, like a, mm -hmm. a work challenge or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, I mean, you being interested in history, I I am assuming you can read, like, as a as a process. I mean, not like words. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, no, no, no. I was thinking, where's he going with this? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, I read a lot. I have yeah. to read a lot. And you you enjoy it, yeah? I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's one thing that. History is my favorite thing to read, but it's not the only thing I like to read. I like to read about philosophy, a bunch of other different things, political theory. Um, but with my line of work and just how busy it is and everything, I, I have not read a non-history piece of work. I can't remember since when, because I just don't have the time. And every time I do, I feel guilty because I'm thinking I could be reading about a, a potential video idea here, you know? Oh, I know the guilt process. I mean, if I if I'm sometimes taking the time to try to play Age of Empires two, you know, I love strategy mm. games. I, I'm playing That's it and I enjoy game. it, but I feel so guilty doing it all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like For I me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel so guilty playing Age of Empires because it aligns with my like. I could rationalize that in my head, you know, to trick <laughs> my own brain. Like, oh, this is technically yeah, yeah. Some, some sort of uh, market research. But you, but you still gotta give the right conditions to your brain. Like it's not like you get a free pass of playing. Like people no, like no. us, I guess we gotta justify of resting because for me it's yeah. very hard to switch off like that. It's yes, that's a great point actually. Yeah. yeah, if I if I rest and I feel like I don't deserve it, mm -hmm. it's, it's the worst thing ever. Then I feel like a prisoner within my own mind because 
all the voices that are coming out saying, why are you resting? You know, you should be working. You don't have a million subscribers. What are you doing resting? I know. And I, I know already because I have a girlfriend who is normal, actually. I know how mm. people might listen to this and listen to, okay, these guys are crazy. Like they are, like, what voices are you talking about? What voices do you yeah, have yeah. in your head? Like, I don't, but, but I understand. Like, it's not literally the voices, but the feeling of guilt and the feeling of I'm not doing enough and stuff like that. Like these are yes. for me, the voices, enough. you know? That's very good. That's exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, we can talk about Ukraine because uh, for the last, like, for the last three weeks, not much was happening, right? Mm. And then this week was he- last week was so heavy for me on YouTube. Two of my videos mm. got demonetized, and one separately got age restricted and then deleted from YouTube, and nothing was happening on the front. And then finally, the Russians decide, okay, Bratan, we're going to take off Divka right now. We have these 300 armored personnel carriers and tanks. And they send all of them. And uh, now it's like a candy shop. Ukrainians are holding their positions mm. and defending like hell in Avdivka. It's, it's beautiful to watch. I know I shouldn't use these words, but like for me, seeing how yeah. Ukrainians defend against this onslaught is like amazing. Can I ask you a question about that? Because uh, with history, you obviously have to have some level of uh, interest in uh, the military aspect too. But I'm not, I'm not that clued up on it. Is it all down to the weapons that are provided to the Ukrainians by the West? Or are the Ukrainians doing something of their own merit as well? Um, don't take... Um, the will to fight into account. Their homeland is being invaded, so it's almost a given that that's going to be present there. But is there something that the Ukrainians are doing special in terms of military strategy as well? Or is it just purely the fact that the West has provided them with these incredible weaponry uh, weapons? Well, yeah, actually, there is so much Ukrainians are doing because the West provides Ukraine with tanks and with artillery shells, but then they assume that Ukraine is going to fight according to Western NATO standards, which mm-hmm. imply that you have artillery superiority, air superiority, and a lot of tanks. And these tanks can roll out when you have these superiorities. Ukraine has these tanks, but they don't have air superiority, meaning that they cannot fight according to Western standards, meaning they have to make up their own way of battlefield alignment with tanks and infantry, with small groupings. It's all different. It's all different from NATO standards, and they made it up. And they took back Kharkiv with uh, yes. with strategies that no one even thought could be possible. They used like teams of three Humvees, and each Humvee had like five people on them. Dismounted, mm-hmm. run over Russian positions, boom, done. Um, NATO didn't teach them that, and th- it went a- actually it went against NATO teachings, but it worked. Mm. The thing is, it's not working now in the south, unfortunately, but uh, this is what they made up. This is how they got Kharkiv back. Second thing is the kamikaze drones. The uh, United States is actually buying like tens of thousands of Ukrainian military startup kamikaze drones right now that Ukrainians are coding, making, 3D printing. So that's another thing they teach the world. So, yeah. I, I, I heard about that. that that's quite uh, ingenious, really. Kamikaze drones. You, you get to save human lives, but it's still the same concept as a kamikaze. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, last time I was in Kiev, we actually trained with some special forces that I cannot say. And they showed me mm-hmm. up close these newest, most secret kamikaze drones. And they were like, they didn't weigh anything. They were so light. They were so mm-hmm. fast. And you see this small little drone and they tell you that it can carry like this big of an explosive. I'm like, what the hell? This is like a bumblebee, you know, it shouldn't be able to fly. It's the same mm-hmm. way if a bumblebee would be carrying like a huge stick. That's how yeah. it felt. So the, the Ukrainian capacity to do this, to lift huge explosives with tiny drones, like that is insane. That's crazy. And have the weapon, uh, have the Russians, pardon me, have they developed any countermeasures for these uh, kamikaze drones or not yet? I mean, they have always had the jammers, there are drone guns, but the point of kamikazes is that they're fast to produce, uh, mass produce, and you cannot produce... The jammers are very expensive to make. Uh, 10,000 kamikaze drones are much cheaper to make, so um, it's just sheer numbers, and the Russian countermeasure, I guess, is to make 
the same amount of numbers of drones to attack the Ukrainians the same way. So, oh, okay. yeah, and Ukrainians also are taking heavy losses on these drones. Like the Lancer drone is not like the cheapest kamikaze drone. It's actually quite expensive compared to like these that I saw. But it's yeah. a huge issue because Ukrainians cannot really take it down or jam it or it's a huge problem. Yeah. Just, just so that I get an understanding in my head of the numbers, when you say it's not cheap to make, what are we talking about? A uh, hundred thousand dollars, one million, ten thousand? How much? Uh, military terms, like, um, what is the U.S. Reaper? Is like ten million or something? I think. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this kamikaze drone that I was holding cost seven hundred dollars. <laughs> And it can take a, down a Ural truck. It cannot take down a tank, but Ural truck, which costs like 50,000. So it can destroy optics on a tank or a BTR. Uh, so you take, let's say you take $700 worth of a drone, you destroy a BTR optics. So it's almost blind or like cannot see at night, whatever it has night vision. You immobilize a BTR or a tank with a $700. So it's That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. And the United States had drones before and they're really good still in the world. But if one costs 10 million and mm. it can be shot down with S300, let's say it can, then it's a problem. Mm. It's about the numbers nowadays. Of course. Of course. Yeah. But what do you like you as an, a, a person of Afghan origins and growing up with the stories and destroyed Russian tanks in a way like how do you feel when you watch these Ukrainian videos destroy Russian tanks again in your vision? I mean, to be honest with you, I'm just like everybody else. I, I did not expect the Ukrainian resistance to be this successful. Um, and not not only this successful, but th this successful for for a sustained period. You know, if I had like short bursts of success... You could put it down, I'm quite a cynical person, you could probably put it down to momentum or to whatever, but uh, it seems like they've got a very, it's been sustained. Um, and I, I just don't understand what what Russia aims to get out of this, you know, like geopolitically speaking. Um, I read somewhere a couple of months ago that the weaponry that Russia was using in this conflict was its old weaponry and this conflict kind of gave it an excuse to kind of flush all those old weapons out and so that they could introduce their new weapons in. Uh, but we haven't really seen that. Um, and I don't really see, I don't really understand what Putin aims to get out of this conflict. I understood I mean, it in the beginning, yeah. but not now. The new weapon thing is always like it's it's Russian propaganda because they they want to have new weapons. They has, have the Su fifty seven. They have the T fourteen Armata. They have the Kinzhal missile. Mm. Su fifty seven like doesn't exist on mass production. T fourteen Armata also doesn't exist on mass production. And the Kinzhal was shot down by a Patriot missile. So all of these Russian Wunderwaffe have failed one by one as soon as you like the Ukrainians have shed light upon them. So the mm. Russians. And new weapons don't really go in, in the same sentence. What they're really good at is mass producing old weapons, which mm. do kill and unfortunately are like semi effective in Ukraine. I'm not mm. saying like they're so stupid. Yes, they can make a lot of BTRs in a month, which is an issue mm -hmm. for Ukrainians, but they cannot right. mass produce Kinzhal missiles or like T 14 Armata, the best tank in the world. Like, yeah, it's not their thing. So okay. if you like, that's my opinion. Oppose, oppose me if you want to, but. Russians and new weapons or Putin having like this plan. Okay, now we're going to bring out this wonder of a... In my eyes, it's it's propaganda. But uh, yeah. I know people think differently. So, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really know what to think, man. I, I just... I try to approach this whole conflict uh, f from like a geopolitical uh, analysis perspective and to see what... Like where the chips are going to fall towards the end of the conflict or what a settlement would look like. Uh, is Ukraine going to go back to the way it looked like on a map before 2014? Um, what exactly is going to be the case? But now with all this trouble in the Middle East, that probably has some impact on it as well. So, well, um, I am. what I'm thinking is that this conflict is slowly pushing Israel to support Ukraine more because Israel is seeing the very strong Russian ties to 
to Iran and to I, I cannot say the H group name because YouTube will immediately demonetize us. I know this already. Okay. But uh, I think this will push Israel to Ukrainian defense. Of course, they cannot give any weapons because they need it right now, or like they are using all of them. But in the future, and also, uh, if you're like asking what Putin gets out of this, is like his personal wet dream is to be the make remaker of the empire. When mm. Gorbachev and Yeltsin put it to the bottom of the sea, then Putin wants to be the one like Peter the First is his idol. So he wants right, to bring right. him back, and he's an old man. He knows he has like 15 years of his life le- yeah, left because of the age already. So if he doesn't do anything now, he, he doesn't ever do it. So he's just fulfilling his his wet dream, honestly. Because uh, of I course, it's bad can, for Russians. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? So th- this uh, this rationale has been thrown thrown about a whole bunch, maybe less so now than in the beginning. But what do you think about the idea that uh, Putin was worried about uh, NATO expanding its realm of influence? Do you buy that or no? Uh, I th- I think he was very worried. Yeah, I mean NATO was expanding, has always been expanding since like since it was made in what fifties. Yeah, forty nine. Yeah, 49. Yeah, yeah, ever yeah, since yeah. that, it has been expanding. So if I was Putin, I would be afraid. But mm. um, I, I don't... The honest answer, yeah, he was afraid. But the thing is, he, had, he has attacked many sovereign nations because of that reason. NATO, I cannot say they have not attacked, like they bombed the Balkans and everything. But um, in my eyes, it doesn't justify the actions at all. Like, they, they're not equal. NATO is expanding by asking, like, by accepting democratic governments who have a democratic vote to go into NATO. And what Putin is doing is totally different. I completely understand. And I definitely don't think it's fair to say that it justifies what's happening because no- nothing ever justifies the killing of uh, ordinary civilians, but um, innocent citizens as well. But um, I think from the West's perspective, I think they are significantly less interested. I'm sorry to be so cynical. Uh, they are significantly less interested in Ukrainian democracy uh, or any post-Soviet country's democracy than it's been made out in the media. I think the primary reason, damn near the only reason why they're doing what they're doing is for their own benefits. And from that perspective, I can understand Putin's fears of, uh, of NATO's expansion infringing upon upon uh, russian sovereignty in some ways in a in a twisted sense you know because his, even historically speaking russia's russia's been very deeply traumatized from external invasions it has a very weird uh, way of dealing with this trauma because it in some ways serves to do the exact same thing to other people, which is not the healthiest way to to deal with your trauma. But yeah, even if you just look at, I mean, three of the worst invasions that have happened in human history happened to them. Mongols, um, Napoleonic France, and uh, and uh, the World War II, right? And let me, so, let me well, guess, they have the European plateau, which doesn't have any mountains in between of Moscow and Berlin, and they need to enlarge the territory people, as much as possible. Yeah. People say that, I mean, I guess in an ideal world, um, that would make sense, but I don't, there's loads of countries that don't have natural I mean, uh, geography as borders. Estonia suffered in each of these invasions, actually. Well, mm. the Mongols mm-hmm. almost reached us, and, and Napoleon also. I, I don't, I'm not sure, but Estonians were sent to fight and die in these wars in both yeah. times. So, I, I think we should occupy as much of Russia as possible because we don't have any land borders, mm. and to put between Thailand and Moscow as much land as possible. I think we should take Siberia, mm. like to on the other side. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's as stupid, honestly, because we're a small country. We are justified even more to be paranoid about our great neighbor than yeah. the big neighbor who is so big and has a very strong army. Like, why are they so paranoid? Like, we, like, it's, it's so stupid. It's imperialistical people, like, justifying murder, basically, in my eyes. Cause Absolutely. The, and for the record, you can never use this to justify you know, like the killing of ordinary people. I think that's quite psychopathic, to be honest with you. But but that's why these reasons are made up, I think, by Russia's like analysts and 
whoever make up their doctrines of philosophy or imperialism. <laughs> The thing, see, this is the really tricky thing with uh, international politics or whatever. It is. When you're dealing with multiple actors, you can both be right. Like what you just said right now, that is an excellent uh, point that Estonians, Lithuanians, Latvians have a lot more to be worried about from Russia because it's a bigger neighbor than vice versa. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, the reverse can also be true. I'm not saying with all due respect to Estonia and the other Baltic countries that Russia is scared of you per se, but Russia is scared potentially of a former foe in the shape of NATO expanding itself. So it's like both can be true at the same time. The really sad thing is for people in the middle, the Estonians, the Lithuanians, the Ukrainians and whatnot, is it all plays out in front of them. This is why me personally, within this conflict, um, I'm living in the West, so I hope I, it doesn't annoy too many people. But I'm, I'm, un, I'm not happy with the role that the, the NATO is playing, not is playing, was playing in the lead up to this. Because to me, this just seems like a rivalry between Russia and NATO playing out to the detriment of the countries in the middle. Ukraine, God forbid, any other countries in the surrounding so, regions. So what, they would NATO, what would NATO have to be doing differently for you to feel the different... Like, what would they need to do for for NATO to react correctly? I'm just asking to provoke, like... Cause... Right, right, right. No, absolutely. <laughs> to be honest with you, man, and I, I feel like you're not going to be satisfied with this explanation... But when you have a really powerful country, you have to be extra careful what you do in its back garden, right? And we can sit here all day and say, oh, but that's irrational, that's illogical. Uh, the smaller countries have a lot more to be worried about the bigger country. But it, it's, it, it, still, it still means that the bigger country is going to be extra paranoid. If somebody went to Cuba and started fermenting anti-American sentiment there, America will react like like a like a like a wild, crazy, tyrannical monster because it's just super worried. I think what NATO should have done is that they should have understood whether it's rational, whether it's fair, it's whatever it is. Russia is not going to accept the fact that you are so close to it and that you are um fermenting a a vision that they don't agree to so you just have to respect their opinion in that surrounding region just because they're a powerful nation you do you see no, what i'm it saying was, it was not like nato's choice to estonians voted in 2004 to join nato like we wanted this Yes, but don't you think like NATO gets? Of course, that's important. But don't you think NATO has a has a say so too? Like, if you understood that Russia is, even if it is illogical, even if it is the wrong, the suboptimum decision to do, uh, Russians or Russia as a country is going to react a certain negative type of way. Why even? Why even attract? That kind of conflict. So, so you are talking now that we provoke Russia by joining the NATO, or NATO, NATO provokes Russia by joining, by accepting Estonia. But the thing is, you're talking NATO, Russia. For Estonians, it's 800 yes. years of history of Russian yes. imperialism. It's not about provoking them. It is about surviving, and the only way to survive is NATO. Before NATO, it was the same way with Soviet Union. Then it was the Russian Empire. Hell, we go back to the Rurikids. Mm -hmm. They even attacked us. So we have yeah, yeah. almost a thousand years of this so before nato it's another 900 years of experience nato or not we always have needed allies in the west to like to resist this tyrannical murderer who is in the kremlin whoever it is it might be ivan the terrible it might be peter the great it, now it's putin it might be stalin mm -hmm. so for estonians this nato stuff is only last three generations for us, it's like one millennia of Russian aggression. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, I can't disagree with you. I can't fault you there. But it's just, yeah, the role NATO played in this, I'm very disappointed. I mean, because, yeah, uh, to be honest with you, like, even now, right? Like, think about the future from now on. Further conflicts happen around the world. And we've already seen in the past two decades with America's role in the world. 
how if it gets stretched out with multiple conflicts and the financial ramifications of that is going to hurt it very deeply. So you have, to, from NATO's perspective, you have to be able to to decide which conflicts to pick and choose better. Because now if you're you're supporting somebody in Ukraine and then war happens in the Middle East, and now you've got to support Israel and then another war happens, you're going to be stretched too thin. It's one of the main ways that empires come crashing down in, uh, in throughout history is when you get stretched too thin. My opinion is that the United States has so much in the barrel that like, they only sent one aircraft carrier to the eastern part of the Mediterranean. They have 10 more, and each mm. one of these could take down a country. I mean, we're, not, um, we're talking about the United States. We, we forget so often how powerful they are, really, if you compare. Like, we, we compare them with Russia. In reality, yeah. there is no comparison. You cannot even compare these militaries. Russia is a third world country. United States is leading the world. So mm. it's that one aircraft carrier is not doing anything. But if it would, it would take down Egypt, Jordan and Syria at one, like, in one blow. Of course, yeah, that's yeah. not the goal at all. But uh, in my eyes, uh, if anybody in the US is watching, yeah, I don't know. But as much as I've read about the United States military and its capacity and the financial capacity, they have the potential to support Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan at the same time. And they still would have a few aircraft carriers just roaming around in the northern sea or something. Mm. Like that's the capacity. So like Fine. people, I, yeah, yeah, carry on. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say military capacity. Absolutely. I don't think the world has ever seen anything like the American military machine. Um, it's ridiculous. But financial capacity, dude, that's a different thing. Financial capacity is a different thing. It's going through its own uh, turbulence uh, domestically with its own economy. Um, its debt is through the roof. I don't even understand how it has so much debt, but it's still so. Uh, but it still runs. Um, financials is different. That can always change. But military, I completely agree with you. The thing is, yeah, United States is like I think it's the biggest debt in the world, but. It has always been like that. It was like that in the, like, correct me in the comments if anybody's watching. I don't know that well, but as much as I've grown up, I've always read in the news that the United States has never been in this much debt. It's like the mm -hmm. SP 500. Whenever you buy it, you buy it at the most expensive. It always goes up. The United mm -hmm. States has always been in debt. And as long as they rule the world, that's when they can allow themselves to be in that much debt. Like if they're suddenly China takes this position or Russia or BRICS, whatever, then they're worried like we owe somebody money but they're mm -hmm. the king of the world right now like they can allow themselves to be in debt and this is not me justifying a huge debt i'm just saying i don't see them falling from that position that's the thing okay can i be honest with you and i i, I hope i don't say this too antagonistically not only do i see them falling yeah. i think the fall has already started and I don't think it's just started like yesterday. I think it's been a couple of years since it started. I mean, if you compare America's unrivaled status as a hegemon 20 years ago to now where it's been faced with failure in Syria, uh, failure in Libya, failure in Afghanistan, failure in Iraq as well, to be quite honest with you, um, its overall opinion in the world is nowhere near as respected as it was 20 years ago. Not even close. By, by who, I have to ask? By the other countries. I mean, Which if ones? you look... Uh, just, I mean, loads. Okay, Saudi Arabia, Iran, um, Russia. When did China. Russia, Saudi Arabia and Iran and China like you? I say, name me a time. Say that again, sorry. When did these four countries ever liked USA, ever at all? Okay, like is a different thing. Respect is is the important word to use here. To respect them? Dude, the whole world respected America after 2001. The whole world respected America because they were so worried about that American reaction after what happened to them in, uh, was it New York? No. New yeah, York, New York, yes. right? Um, the thing and... is, you, you you read me four different occasions where the United States failed in Iraq, in Syria, stuff like that. Let's let's go back to the Cold War. In mm -hmm. in Korean War, 
I mean, they didn't lose, but still the communists held on to North Korea. In the Vietnam War, America's flat out lost. And then in the 91, the Soviet Union collapsed. The stronger system mm-hmm. prevailed. Now we have another mm-hmm. communi- communist country, China. And the United States is again in the brackets failing all these conflicts. But in my mm-hmm. eyes, it doesn't matter if you have this respect or if you fail. In the end, if the system collapses, and I, I see China collapsing before the United States, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, and Russia, we cannot, like, Russia is not comparable to the United States in any way. Like, no, 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 no. We yeah, don't even right. have to put them in the equation. It's, no, it's right China now, versus US. Yeah, yeah. Right now it's just China versus America. But yeah. 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 Uh, the, the weaker system collapsed, and the Soviet Union was the only adversary that could actually rival the United States, like, in, militarily, not definitely financially. And now it's mm-hmm. China in the same way. They're rivaling them both on both levels, actually. But mm. I am a, a deep believer in, in um, democratic capitalism and a, as a better system of functioning as a society. Uh, so in my eyes, there's no doubt that communism will fail because my grandfather, my mother, everybody grew up during communism. It is impossible to run that in long term and people to win from it. It's, it does just, it's a fraudulent system. Good. Dude, I am not a sympathizer with communism. I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's very silly, and I think uh, communism will always be destined to fail as a result of its own failures. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Also, the West, for loads of other reasons too, man, social and cultural reasons, um, I, 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 I just think the decline has already started. Wow. Well, I think yeah, the future is probably going they... to be a multipolar world. That's what they say in Russia, actually, that the West is rotting and it's the decline has started. But, I mean, knowing how the Russians mentally deal with um, aggression and trauma, they always just deal with it aggressively every time. If, if they're yeah. going down, they say the other one is going down. Look, I know Russia, it's not even the Russian state, it's Russian people, actually. Not all the people, but these kind of Russian people who are not educated, like debils, we call them in Estonia. We have many very educated, smart Russians who are working and they like speak Estonian. And then we have the other ones who listen to Putin and they're like, accept everything. And these have this debil mindset and they're always acting the same way. If you say to them, for example, you're living in Estonia for the third generation, please learn a stolen language, mm. they hit you in the face. And you can mm. see how, how they react because their country reacts like this. And mm. this is a weak mindset. This is mm. like a, a mindset of a person who is afraid. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I get that. I get that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, for me as an Estonian... Um, a <laughs> small country next yeah. to Russia. I mean, Estonia has never been kind of been able to live independently. We had mm. independence 1918 to 1939. Then the mm. Soviets came in. Then yeah. the 1991, we got independence again. And now we're in NATO. Like this is, for me, at least, European Union and NATO are these two great Unities that are saving my family, my country, my language, my culture. Like without yeah, those yeah. two, Estonia would not be able to exist. That's yeah. the tough reality in my country. So yeah. yeah. No, I completely understand, man. I completely understand that. Yeah. But uh, but it's uh, you're in UK, right? Yeah. UK is super safe. I mean, even mm. Napoleon couldn't take it. The Hitler couldn't take it. The Vikings were the only ones, I guess, who took it. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been over a thousand years. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, I guess it's 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 different to view from there, like to watch the bigger geopolitical picture. And, Absolutely no. Yeah. It, there's a there's a phrase that I really like: skin in the game. I I a lot of I am humbled. I have to remain humble about my conclusions based on the fact that I don't have as much skin in the game as you per se, you know, being right next to UK is so far away that uh, the likelihood that I'm going to suffer as a result of it indirectly. I feel like loads of most of the world has uh, been affected by this conflict, but directly I'm not in as much danger as you are. So that's that's a big difference. I mean, um, thanks to nature, I'm not in any danger, actually. 
Mm. Uh, it might seem weird from the United Kingdom, but uh, actually, yeah, in a, like I, I would actually say that I'm not in any danger because we have uh, United okay. States soldiers in the country. We have F-35s coming to fi Finland. I mean, <laughs> these F-35s mm. could wipe St. Petersburg from the earth in one hour. So mm. um, we have such capabilities here that Russia cannot match in, in 20 years. Wow. And that's all thanks to NATO countries. Yeah. And like no, it's not public information here, but I know it, and that's it. this is why I feel much better. <laughs> I understand that. I understand that makes yeah. perfect sense. To be fair, so people in Estonia right now they're not uh, they're not like super worried or super scared, as I'm sure they would have been at the beginning of the conflict, you know, spreading there. Oh no, people are afraid. But I'm a military blogger. Like I know, I know stuff we have, and I know like the unknown or secret stuff that we have here. NATO capabilities that nobody should know about, but it's like public secret. So, and I know that the Russian divisions uh, that were here for Estonia and Finland have been sent to Ukraine. The Bifa, Bihkva the Saintniks, Pskov the Saintniks, they're all been minced up for a year. Like they don't exist anymore. And these existed only to take Estonia. For like 30 years, they were on our border, just to be ready. And they're gone. So wow. for Estonia, the behind the border is emptier than it ever was. Mm. Uh, this is why we're sending so much to Ukraine, because our only survival is to like survive Russia. And Ukraine mm. is helping us right now. So we're sending like 33% of our entire military GDP to Ukraine. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Damn. Yeah, that makes perfect sense why you guys would be so invested in that. Oh, yeah. We're giving more than we should. Like, we're giving more that it actually hurts our capabilities. But we only have these military capabilities to, to fight Russia. Mm. And Ukrainians are, like, really helping us right now. So, Slavo Ukraine. That makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. That is. Yeah. And the Russians, of course, call us Russophobes. Well, it's hard not to be a Russophobe if, if somebody's beating you for a thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard yeah, yeah. not to turn into one. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. in the real sense, we're not Russophobes. Like, I, I speak Russian a little bit and uh, I enjoy mm. Russian music. I listen to it actually sometimes. Mm. Um, I, I try to make sure the artist is not like pro Russia, is pro Ukraine or something. But uh, I play the accordion. I know every Russian song like that is older than me <laughs> on accordion. Yeah. So I'm not a Russophobe. Definitely not. But I, I, I'm an Estonian patriot. So. Is it, do you, Arthur, have you noticed, is it a, um, does it come from politics or do you notice some sort of a sentiment amongst ordinary Russians you've met as well that is a little bit on the aggressive slash belligerent side with its uh, Baltic neighbors? Do you get that from ordinary Russians too? Or do you think this, this just plays out within the political arena? Mm, do you mean Russians in Russia? Uh, Russians in Russia, I guess, but uh, I'm sure there are some Russians living in Estonia as well, or maybe they come to visit, not now probably, but like before. Do, do you get any sort of a sentiment amongst Russian society that not looks down at Estonia or anything, hmm. but, you know, they have, an, yeah, they have some sort of a prejudice against them in some way, shape or form? Well, that prejudice that you call is that they call us Nazis and Russophobes, yeah. And the whole country does it. Oh, the whole country. Okay, so that was my question. Oh, yeah. Is it just politicians, Russian politicians, or oh, is it no, just... It's, it's the people... In Russia, uh, the people are sheep, usually. The people mm. who are not sheep, they left the country when mobilization happened. So if the sheep listen to the herder saying that Estonians are Nazis, they're all going to repeat it blindly. And mm. how the hell are we Nazis? We were occupied by the Nazis. Like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> we were killed yeah, yeah. by them. Uh, yeah. But uh, the Russians call us that and they repeat everything Putin says. I mean, a regular Russian accepts everything Putin says blindly, which is that the Estonians are Nazis. Mm. Yep. So for us, it's fight or survive. Like there's, there's no, there's no talking with them. They are like, the language is also, you need to know how to talk to Russians. Not like the people, I'm not saying all the people are like that, but Russia has a state. You need to know how to talk to them. And before Ukrainian war, Everybody was calling us like warmongers and like these small little dogs who clap all the time, Baltic states. Now mm. everybody sees that we were right. They are murderers and like horrible people in, in mm. the Russian Kremlin, you know. It's 
because we know how to talk to them. We know how to read their statements. Uh, mm. We know how this aggressive language works. And yeah. That's one really tragic uh, part of politics, international politics, whatever you want to call it, is you, you made a, you said something that was very interesting. Um, talking doesn't work. So you said something like that. Um, and yeah, sometimes things get to a stage where whether you talk or not, it doesn't really mean anything. You know, it's uh, time for action. And a lot of the times that action can mean war. Um, I mean, uh, you, you so, can, you can talk to a person like you, you can talk to a person like me, even if we would be, let's say we would be super different, or if you would be a most Putinist Russia next to me right now, I could still mm -hmm. listen to you and let you speak and then oppose you in a civilized manner. These are the mm -hmm. rules of engagement here. You know, we, we listen, then we oppose. Yeah. Russia doesn't have these rules of engagement. They play differently. So you need to know how to play with their rules. And the West doesn't know because the West has democratic, let's listen to each other, kumbaya rules. Russia has uh, street rules. Choblat, yeah. boom, that's Russian yeah. rules. And yeah. if you don't play by them, they like Germany, for example, who were trying to, what what was it? Merkel, I think, had this policy of econ through economic means reduce yeah, the yeah, need. Yeah all bullshits doesn't mm. like russia just used it and laughed yeah mm. so yeah and i i have to say this disclaimer i'm not an aggressive or violent man at all i'm the softest guy in the world i hate violence like in regular life i always choose words if somebody mm. wants to attack me i use my legs before my i, I run away so mm. like, but if like if my country is attacked i know like in some ways you cannot use words yeah um, no, 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 absolutely. And uh, just, I mean, I wasn't born, but going back to the Afghan, uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, it was a very similar type of sentiment amongst the uh, resistance fighters on the Afghan side. There was just no interest in talking because once somebody invades your country, what is there to talk about? <laughs> like, yeah. what are we going to talk about? Yeah. Well, how is your invasion going? Are you feeling good yeah. about murdering my family? Yeah. No, yes, yeah, nothing to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. This is why I always say this. People in the West are like, oh, end this war, no to war, peace in Ukraine. I'm like, every like, if, if, if you want peace through negotiations right now, only Russia mm -hmm. wins from it. So everybody who's like a peacemonger, let's use the word, is actually yeah. pro-Russian. So they don't know it. They're like useful fools for Putin. Right mm -hmm. now, honestly... What I think, and the only way to do it, is war until Ukraine liberates all of the territory. Otherwise, Russia wins. Mm. Do and you they... think, let me ask you a question, Arthur. Do you think that's uh, possible? Because I've been keeping up to date with this conflict. Um, and um, it seems like right now is a very, if, if, if Ukraine, if negotiations were to start, Ukraine would be at its most advantageous point right now than in the entire conflict. And I'm talking all the way back to 2014 as well, by the way. Um, because with Russia attacking it, trying to take over Kiev and everything else and failing in that, and then at least in the last few months, having been pushed back, um, way uh, losing more territory than they had uh, at any point in the conflict, now would probably be the most advantageous point for the Ukrainians to go to the negotiation table. Do you think it's possible to completely push Russia out of that eastern part and even Crimea? I see that you don't understand the Russian mindset. If Russia, if Ukraine would talk to Russia right now and uh, it would be peace in these good conditions for Ukraine that they got some land back, Russia wins. Yeah. This is how they get land. They attack, mm -hmm. they're pushed back, and they win some. They do it again, they do it again. This is how Russia works for the last thousand years. This is Russian imperialism. Russia mm -hmm. wins through using their men as biomass, being pushed back, but still gaining like 10% right. of the country they occupied. Uh, right. Any centimeter given to Russia is giving another centimeter tomorrow and tomorrow. The way to read Russia is you don't take anything, nothing at all. Otherwise, they take this part of Ukraine. Tomorrow, they take this part of Estonia. Then a little mm. bit from... Look at the Winter War. Yeah. Russians took seven percent. One of my favorite modern conflicts, by the way, to study. It's incredible. 
incredible. Finland, Finland lost like a hu- huge areas of ethnic Finnish people. They all had to move out. It's mm. of course they fought back, and people think like the Soviet Union lost its war. They didn't actually. Mm. They occupied eleven percent of the country, yeah. and same in Ukraine. They occupy like twenty something percent. And this this war would end the same way. They get this area. And then the next in the in Georgia they occupy some areas in Chechnya they occupy like this is how they work. To talk mm-hmm. now in the advantageous position of Ukraine is to lose to Russia. Uh, in my eyes, no talk, just take back everything. Very interesting. Very interesting. Would you? Sorry, just a follow up question on that. I feel like the roles have reversed a little bit. I'm asking you. <laughs> um, um, so, having said, uh, said that, would you not be worried about the um, Ukraine's ability to perform what would essentially be a war of attrition? Do you think they have the resources and capacity for uh, to go head to head with a behemoth like Russia in terms of an attrition, um, a war of attrition? Well, tell me what happened in Afghanistan. The biggest and most stro- strongest country in the world lost to a bunch of farmers who had only one magazine and a Kalashnikov. Okay. What yeah, happened fair. in Vietnam? Every fair, big fair. empire with a big uh, modernized army will lose to farmers with Kalashnikovs. That's how it is. Mm. Because mm. you cannot occupy all the woods, all the swamps. Uh, Ukrainians hate the Russians right now. They you, Ru- Russia just made 30 million enemies in Ukraine. Um, mm. There is no way they occupy such a big country with like this bad of an army that they have the united states had 10 times better army in afghanistan they still couldn't do it in 20 years Mm. because it's impossible to occupy these mountains and everything same in ukraine i was was hoping you would say that because that that's one of the most fascinating things when you read about these david versus goliath type uh conflicts throughout history is Mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense it made no sense that afghanistan beat the soviet union you know no. But they did. The same in Vietnam. Like uh, if you look at the, the difference yeah. in capacity and capability of the of the different actors, it's crazy. And like we're talking one and a half years and, and Russia is like doing horribly. We've talking fifteen yeah. years of this occupation. It's like Russia has to pour everything they have into it all the time, meaning they would die out like the Soviet Union slowly, which is America's goal, of course. But yeah. uh, there is no way they occupy this country and like add it to the Russian Federation. In the end, they will collapse like the Soviets, or they have to pull out. Like there is no way Russia wins this in the long term. Yeah, and I think the the pullout is going to be uh, difficult for Putin to do, right? Because if he pulls he, he out, can, uh, it's a political suicide. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, how's that going to reflect politically on him? <laughs> Goodwill gesture. We love the Ukrainians so much. We have to pull back our armies because there were some civilian casualties. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what they do. Russia, again, how to read the Russian statements? Uh, goodwill gesture is always, oh shit, we're doing so bad. We have to pull back. Then we mm. they do a goodwill gesture and they pull back and it's like, ah, they, in the in the military they use. Pulling back to more advantageous positions. It's actually just falling back in shame. But mm. uh, that's that's how it is. But mm. I, 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 bat, I bother Russia a lot here. I have to say they have learned so much, actually. So like yeah. oppose, my, oppose myself. Yeah. Uh, Kharkiv, Izim offensive, right? Mm-hmm. They got beaten so bad by the Ukrainians. Ukrainians mm-hmm. used the very same tactic in the southern offensive of, of, of this summer. And mm. the Russians held... The Russians held, they didn't run like they did in Izium. Uh, mm-hmm. Ukrainians got beaten quite bad in this offensive in, in June and July. So Russians learned, adapted, and overcome, mm-hmm. overcame that tactic. So I have to give it to them. They, they can learn, and it's very mm-hmm. deadly for Ukrainians. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see whether at some point I don't know why this would happen, but whether America changes its stance on giving uh, Ukraine um, fighter jets and things of that nature as well, right? Because they're they, they're holding out on that. If I if I read correctly, I think the F sixteen is only a matter of time because it just takes so much time to give a fighter jet. It's it's a very impossible thing logistically to do actually. So it's they need even even the training hasn't ended or like it just takes months. But of course, F-16 is going to Ukraine. You think so? Because from, oh, yeah. from 
the the reason I bring it up is because from the things that I've read, it seems like a lot of Western analysts think the reason why uh, Biden is is not such a big fan of giving um, air power to Ukrainians is because they're worried that it might escalate the conflict. I don't know to what else because it's a fully blown war. So h- how much more can it escalate? But um, that that's their rationale. What do you think about that? I know that from America or maybe even United Kingdom, it's also a nuclear country. It's like, mm. okay, yeah, it can escalate to a nuclear war. Mm. Uh, so US has a lot to lose there. UK has a lot to lose. Estonia never had nuclear weapons. We were next to Soviet Union and the Russian. Like, for us, if there is no NATO, if there is Uk- no Ukraine and Russia occupies Estonia, I will be shot. My family will be shot. Mm. My mm. friends will be deported to Siberia. For me, nuclear weapons are not... If, is it a nuclear bomb or a bullet? Which one is mm. it? So mm. for me, escalation is not a problem at all. Mm. And for Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Polish, Ukrainians, it's not. A, it's a problem for, for Americans because they have a lot more to lose there. But for us, it's... I know Russia occupies Estonia, 20,000 is put to the wall and shot behind the, the head. That's what happened with Stalin. So mm. for us, I don't care. Let them escalate. Mm. We need we need our freedom. Right, right, right. No, that makes sense, man. I yeah. Understand. So I, I, I know it's 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 a very. I'm aware of how they see uh, Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians, like in Europe, like oh these Russophobes always talking about how Russia is so big and bad. Well, if Russia occupied, like Russia never occupied the United Kingdom or like Western Germany or anything, so. Mm. My grandfather was sent to Siberia when he was four years old. Two weeks wow. on a train, animal cart. Uh, people died on that train. They were just thrown out of the out of the tracks. And he was in Siberia four to eight. And when he was eight years old, he was allowed to come back. So and why was he tell- sent? Back? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Is it? Is it because he was Estonian? He didn't do well. I was just, I was just gonna say, did he do anything? But then I realized he was four years old. He was four. No, I mean, okay. Uh, short backs. You know what the kulak, not the gulag, but kulak. Yeah, the kulaks. Yeah, yeah. The uh, farmers who work harder. A bit. Rich, rich farmers. Yeah. How, how did they get rich? <laughs> oh, it was the collectivization policy of Lenin, right? No, I, I'm like asking provocative questions. The thing is, Russian people in the Soviet Union. I'm, Strictly talking about Russian people, not the Ukrainians, because Ukrainians are very hardworking, different. But Russian people are, their work ethic is not German. We our work ethic is German. We always had fertile soil. We worked a lot in Estonian lands. Then the Soviets came, and they thought, okay, we are poor because like they are rich, we have to pay them. Estonian kulaks, let's say. But yeah. the Estonian farmers were richer than the Russians because they worked so much more. And they had these goals of buying out their farms from the noble nobility and uh, working for 40 years to pay off the farm rent. Russians didn't do that. They, they like, if you go to Russia, you see like gardens are broken, uh, houses are old, not repaired. In Estonia, like every, everything has to be ordnung, you know, done. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Lenin is like, okay, we, class difference. Estonian farmers rich, they're very bad, send everybody to Siberia. Let's eliminate that class. Oh, wow. And this is why my grandfather was the son of a man who worked 40 years to buy out his farm from nobility. Mm. Uh, and then he bought it out and actually got wealthy because he worked more years. And the father was shot. And I mean, my grandfather's father was shot and grandfather was put to train. Damn. Yeah, so under Russians, you cannot be hardworking because they, they cannot stand it. Because they don't like to work, but they don't like if you have more money. <laughs> so it's, it's like really, it, yeah, it's really bad. In Russia, everybody has to be equally poor. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> um. yeah, it's weird, I know. Also, my um, um, grandfather told a story like they they were hiding forest brothers also like that was in the 50s already when stalin occupied estonia and finally they found these forest brothers and and my my great aunt aunt old aunt was talking that they found like these six or seven forest brothers they bought them brought them out to the front of the house and they just shot them all 
Um, and my and my aunt was like, she was there. She knew all of the guys, and and that's it. She had to bury them, and she had to work the next day. Like it, that was life as an Estonian in the Soviet Union, watching yeah. how everybody you know gets shot, and then you have to still work in the coal horse. <laughs> yeah the yeah, next day yeah. so for us it's like you know and that that's the thing man a, a lot of people they don't take into account historical trauma right that's a pretty good phrase mm, yeah, uh you don't forget that you know like your grandfather must have told you stories as you were growing up and then that 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 precedent is just going to pass on future generations too but to people who are disconnected, this is why I always have to humble myself, uh, to people who are disconnected from the conflict, who don't have as much skin in the game, they're not going to be able to understand uh, the little, the finer intricacies and whatnot. Yeah. And also, like, I tell all this stuff, but I am an open-minded person. I understand and I can listen to people and I'm not going to, like, be very blind about it and... Uh... I also see how people might listen to this and say I'm I'm a total total traumatized Russophobe, and it is mm. true. I am. My family has been traumatized. My country has been traumatized, and this affects my judgment. That's how it is. Yeah, uh, I'm not blind yeah. to it. Yeah, it's good that you're aware of that. To be fair, yeah, it's good yeah. that you're aware of that because I I always um, like even when I was growing up, the whole Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, it. I would be deemed a traitor to my family, to my way of life, if I said something pro-Bolshevik or pro-communist, you know? And um, there's only, like, what can I do? I, I just grew up in that. You know, you just inherit some of this stuff. But I think the most important thing is just to be aware of it, whatever that yeah. means. Yeah, I, I, I can have my views and values and opinions, but I also value open-mindedness and dialogue, so... Mm. This is why some people in YouTube actually have commented. I have made recent, like a year ago, I made podcasts with a lot of people, and one of them was History Legends. And I didn't mm. know back then that he was pro Russia. Now I know. Mm. But And people were really angry, my viewers. How did you give him platform? And for me, it's like, yeah, I don't want to give platform for pro Russian people, but mm. since it already happened, it's like not big, that big of a deal. Like, he cannot do anything to me I, I can listen to him and understand my enemy you know understand him intele intellectually it's it's not like i have to no every every time i make a video i also watch what putin is saying yeah i'm not saying that like mm, i don't know how to express myself no but, no no uh, I, know, I know exactly what you're trying to articulate out there like even in in warfare you have a person like say somebody invades your country right mm -hmm it's very difficult to hate a person more than in that instance, the, per the, the invader, right? Mm -hmm. But in order to repel the invader, you kind of need to understand them. Oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. If you want to have a good chance of a, of, of a counterattack and whatnot, um, of a good strategy. So you have to empathize with them. Okay. Why did they invade me? Even mm -hmm. if you disagree with that rationale, you, ha you have to almost understand how they think, how they feel yeah. so then you can subsequently strategize from that point onwards because if you don't and you just see them as an external entity as an alien um you will underestimate them like putin did to ukrainians absolutely absolutely if not underestimate them you mess up in some other way like you just you you yeah it would just uh, you'll pay a bigger cost for victory even if you do win you know but if you mm -hmm. could just understand them, the victory could have come a little easier, a little sooner. So it's absolutely essential, man. Yeah, I don't think you this... should feel bad for that. Yeah, this is why for me, like, I understand my viewers don't like it, but, and I'm not going to include like super pro-Russian people, but for me, it's not a problem to discuss. And I'm I'm strong enough with my opinions that I don't know, I'm not afraid to talk because I know this person yeah. cannot like influence me like that, but I can listen to him and try to change his mind with my words and mm -hmm. if i can do that i actually should feel good about myself yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but Absolutely. actually uh Tariq, i i have to go i have a thing coming up uh it's such oh, an interesting con I, I feel bad but i have an event coming up right now but we can make part two i'm down for that man this was a great conversation i'd love to do a part two yeah, and everybody who's watching, uh, go and check out Tarek's channel, Hikma History, in the description below. Subscribe to him also. 
And uh, I guess be back for the next episode with Tarek. All right. Take care, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.